Um, I'm going to frame, we're going to talk about equality in terms of gender equality, um, sexual minorities, and racial and ethnic divides. And then we're going to talk about stewardship primarily in terms of, well, actually exclusively in terms of self-care. So, Lee, could you please read the Magnificat to us? My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful. Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Thank you. So when George Fox was told that he was creating difficulty because women were preaching in friends' congregations, this was his answer about women's place in the church. Mary, the mother of Jesus, had a soul, and her prayers are recorded in the Bible. Get around that. Paul's epistles consistently, fairly consistently, argue against the equal place of women in the early Christian community. He was pretty happy to take women's money, but he reminded women to be silent, to be submissive to their husbands, and to submit themselves to the patriarchal cultural norms that were in fact contrary to Jesus' example. I would recommend to you the non-canonical book entitled The Acts of Paul and Thecla, which offers a more complex story of women's role in the Pauline times of the early church. The biblical canon was selected as much as possible to kind of erase the, these pieces of women's history um, from the early church, but it hasn't been possible to do that because Jesus was so radically egalitarian. He invited women to listen to his teachings as we heard when we reviewed the story of Mary and Martha the other day. He healed women of both spiritual and physical afflictions that would, uh, these women would otherwise have been shunned by the entire community. So two examples are the adulterous woman at the well um, and the woman with the hemorrhage who had been bleeding for several years. Each of these women would have been completely unacceptable in their community, but he was glad to make space for them and to tell them that their faith had made them well. My favorite story about um, Jesus' treatment of women actually comes after his death. Uh, and this is the story of Mary Magdalene as she visits the tomb and it comes from John 20, 11, 18. Mary is in many traditions known as the apostle to the apostles. Pretty hard to argue against our place in the pulpit. So I wanna tell you a story, a real life story about something that happened to me based on this. Um, I'm the chaplain to Queen's University and a couple of years ago, the Coptic Pope came to visit and this was a huge deal. Um, CSIS security everywhere in case somebody tried to assassinate the guy and um, quite a large auditorium at Queens completely full um, with Coptic uh, people who have come from all over to, to be with the Pope. And um, I'm one of two women on the stage, myself and the Dean of Arts and Science in this sea of black robes, right? including um, bishops and so on from other, the Anglican tradition and so on. Uh, so religious officials everywhere, me and the Dean of Arts and Science on the stage. And that's all a little awkward and fine, but I'm, I'm glad I'm sitting up there, not to witness to my authority, but to the witness to the presence of women in the world, right? Um, anyway, a little girl of 10 years old got up at the question period and said to the Pope, 
why can't I be Pope? And he said, well, why can't I be a mummy? And people, you guys reacted totally differently. The audience laughed. They thought it was hilarious. Um, and then he said, well, more seriously, little girl, Adam was created first, and women were created second, and so men have the right to be in charge. <laughs> and, right. and the room bursts into applause, and the only thing I can do to reasonably protest this event is sit on my hands. So that's what I did. I got, I got up and I sat on my hands. And I don't think anybody noticed, but it made me feel better. Anyway, after this was all over, I went and found this little girl. And um, I started to tell her this version of the story and to assure her that she did have a place in God's church. And I wasn't anywhere near finished what I wanted to tell her when she put her hands on her hips and said, I know. <laughs> And then she gave me the most fabulous feminist theological lecture about how someday she was going to rule the world because she had her place in it. It was totally awesome. And when she was finished, I said, and what's your name? And she said, Miriam. <laughs> so lest we think all of the evidence in favor of women's equality comes from the New Testament, let me just say briefly this is not the case. Um, we heard, sorry? Okay. Um, it's not the case that women's equal, the evidence for women's equality comes just from the New Testament. We heard some stories of women's hero, heroism the other day. And there are actually many places in the Hebrew scriptures where God is uh, referred to as having feminine qualities. Um, God is a mother hen, uh, wisdom as belonging to the feminine, and so on. Um, let's talk about equality and homosexuality. There are t a total of six verses in the Bible that speak against homosexuality. That's not very many out of a rather large book. Um, but if you want a particularly good and succinct examination of those scriptures, I would recommend to you the work of Matthew Vines. Um, and for those tweeting our discussion, if that's happening today, there's a really great five-ish minute video with Matthew Vines on Upworthy um, that's well worth sharing, as Upworthy would suggest. Anyway, uh, Vines points out that in context, the verses so frequently cited against homosexuality are not, in fact, referring to consenting committed relationships. They refer to gang rape, adulterous homosexual sex, um, so men who are married having sex with other, married to women having sex with other men, sex between older men and young boys, and the sexual abuse of slaves by masters. A few of us might be looking for texts to support polyamory, but I'm afraid we can't come up with any of those. Um, but I certainly hope that we can differentiate between the sexual abuse and gluttonous um, sexual activity and consensual relation, respectful relationships. The preponderance of the biblical material that encourages believers to bring in all walks of life, bring all walks of life into the sacred community, certainly outweighs these six verses referring to specific behavior. So it condemns the behavior, but it doesn't condemn homosexuality in general. Um, so the final text that is helpful with this issue is the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. But this one is from Acts 26, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. But an angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So an angel has told him to do this. This is a desert road and he rose and went. And behold, an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a minister of the, of the Candace, it says, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of all her treasure, had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot. He was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go up and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? 
And the eunuch invited Philip to come and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture which he was reading was this, as a sheep led to the slaughter or a lamb before its shearer is dumb, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken up from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom, pray, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news of Jesus. And as they went along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What is to prevent me being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught up Philip, and the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing, passing on, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. So here we have a man of sexual minority um, seeking the truth in the scriptures, and when it's time for the, the symbolic, when he asks for the symbolic act of inclusion in the Christian community, that of baptism, what is to stop me from being baptized? And Philip can come up with no argument. Turning to racial and ethnic equality, we could also look at the story of um, the Good Samaritan. The parable, the parable of the Good Samaritan. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied, do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. So often when this story is preached, we only ever get as far as the Samaritan was the guy who did the right thing. But the story in context is that Samaritans were outsiders and Jesus was talking to the people who had the power in society, right? And the people who had the power in society were trying to challenge Jesus and prove him wrong. And instead, he ends up calling them out and saying, these, these other people, these outsiders, these ethnic others who you treat like dirt can get it right when you miss the mark. That is, in context, the most useful way to look at the story. So... For millennia, really, both the Hebrew scriptures and the New Testament have been used to say that certain ethnicities are superior to others. First, the jo Jewish folk justifying themselves as God's chosen people, and later, European folk also claiming to be superior because of their particular brand of Christianity. One biblical story that has been used in this sense um, sorry, is the Hebrew scriptures account of God ordering the genocide of the Canaanites. And I think we talked about this the other day, but I might have just thought about it. Uh, anyways, many authors look at this 
when people use this to justify um, genocide or uh, racial othering, people like to point, other scholars like to point out that in fact the Canaanites' problem was a moral, behavioral problem rather than their ethnic identity. Um, and I don't think any of us want people smote for their behavior any more than we want people smote for their ethnicity, um, but we, can't, we still can't take that scripture out of context and apply it to um, people's ethnicity. So I would like to launch off, off this illustration uh, to argue that the biblical theme we have long referred to in our testimonies as equality should probably now be adapted to what contemporary scholars understand as equity. The act of the Samaritan who does the right thing in spite of societal rejection and otherness. Um, the widow's might, which we'll have read in a minute. Uh, and actually, let's have the widow's might now. Let's, let's do that. As he taught, Jesus said, watch out for the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. And I want to those mics so okay. just read the whole thing. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts. But a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live in, live on. Thanks. So um, again, often this story is taught just with the focus on the widow's might and that when poor people give from what little they have, they're giving more than rich people who give a smaller percentage of their wealth. Um, but there's another piece of context to this story, which is that Jesus is actually calling out, again, calling out the people in power who are living off um, the impoverished people, right? Both as landlords and by um, demanding their donations to the, um, to the synagogues. The, um, the irony of this scripture is that it's always used by pros those prosperity gospel folk that we talked about earlier in the week to say, no matter how little you have, you should send it to me and you'll be blessed. And yet, of course, many of them are living incredibly luxurious lives. Um, and if they just read the, the verse before, they'd realize they really, really should not be doing that. <laughs> Um, so then, finally, in terms of equity, uh, Matthew 20, uh, verses 11 to 17. For the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, you go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Going out again at about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing, and he said to them, Why do you stand here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, Well, you go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last, up to the first. And when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the householder, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. 
Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first and the first last. So here we have the notion that there's no earning God's grace, right? No matter how good we are, no matter what we do in this lifetime, our reward is not, according to this Christian theology, our reward is not based on what we accomplish or do or attempt. Our reward is based on God's generosity. And similarly, we're to... Um, we're to live that out, right? We're to follow God's example and not worry about whether or not people merit our care and our love. We're simply to treat them with care and love. When we're hit, we're to turn the other cheek and so on. So again, I would, I would argue that this scripture supports the concept of equity. Um, so does the, pro the story of the prodigal son, which we had read yesterday, where the guy who got it all wrong gets the reward when he comes home, and um, his brother's annoyed because he's always done the right thing. So uh, these themes pop up in more than one place. Some Hebrew scripture citations about God's preference for the orphaned, the widow, uh, and the traveler, uh, we've talked about these earlier in the week. There is a pretty clear tension in the Hebrew scriptures between those who want to maintain the purity of the Jewish people and, the pro and what the prophets from the Hebrew scriptures tell us is God's will for the proper treatment of the vulnerable. In Exodus, Deuteronomy, Jeremiah, and Zechariah, there are multiple references to the proper treatment of widows, orphans, and travelers. All of these instructions involve ensuring that the vulnerable are made comfortable, fed, and cared for. And Jesus named the same priority. He so often spoke in parables with cloaked meaning, but he get, did give two specific instructions. The first is the commandment we'd heard earlier, to love, and we've talked about that already. But the second set is in Matthew 25, verses 35 to 45. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, O blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the fountain of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed thee, or thirsty and give thee drink? And when did we see thee a stranger and welcome thee, or naked and clothe thee? And when did we see thee sick or in prison and visit thee? And the king will answer them, Truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me, naked, and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when did we see thee hungry or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to thee? And then he will answer them, truly, I say to you, as you did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Uh, so this gets a little confusing because we just talked about how we can't earn God's grace. And then I tell you the only commandment Jesus really was specific about was uh, behaving kindly to the poor and the imprisoned. Um, and, you know, you can have a very long discussion yourselves about uh, faith versus works, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I would argue that works are a sign of our faith, for sure. Um, in any case, uh, Jesus is pretty clear. We're to be kind to people who are in trouble and who are uh, in difficulty, especially when we're in a position to share. 
So, uh, stewardship. Um, there are many ways we could talk about stewardship, and I know that the Quaker testimony of stewardship is most often spoken of in ecological terms. We could also discuss it in terms of finances and physical resources and so on, um, but I think you'll find those arguments are pretty easy to access. I wanted to talk, um, to pick up on something that Maggie spoke of in the, in the lecture the other night, and this is the issue of self-care. I want to argue that it's important that we steward ourselves as one of God's gifts to the world. I have often heard friends talk about this in the framework of the peace testimony, and I think that is a helpful way to think about it. It flies in the face of our peace testimony to do violence to ourselves through neglect, poor nutrition, substance abuse, or overwork. I have been guilty of all of these things at various points in my life and fully expect that I will be again, although at this point I'm happy to report that my drugs of choice are chocolate and coffee. In any case, these tendencies are part of the human condition, but ne neglect and overwork do seem to run rampant among committed friends. I would not be the first to suggest that this is counter what, to what we aspire to witness to the world and that we need to treat ourselves with more compassion. We're not going to look at specific scripture um, for this discussion, but rather the power of a certain framing of the crucifixion. How many people are um, familiar with the concepts of sacrificial or substitutionary atonement? Does anybody feel good enough about it that they want to give us an explanation? I think the ba basic idea is that we're um, uh, that that one person can take on someone else's, or in this case, society's, everyone's sins, um, and therefore that although we're we're flawed and have sinned, that Jesus' sacrifice uh, takes that off of us, um, and therefore God forgives us through Jesus' sacrifice. Yeah, awesome, thank you. Um, another way of talking about it is scapegoating, right? You put all the sins of the community on the head of the goat and you drive the goat out of the community. Uh, so I really, there's a fantastic sermon on this um, written by a woman named Catherine Faith McLean. She's a United Church minister. And it's in a book entitled, Preaching the Big Questions, Doctrine Isn't Dusty. Um, but Kindle wasn't my friend this week, and so I couldn't pull the references out that I wanted to give to you. Um, but she really explains that um, very nicely the difficulties um, with substitutionary or sacrificial atonement, so I'm going to do my best. Um, there's, there's a couple of problems. One is that obviously we're not taking responsibility for our own selves if we uh, rely too much on the um, grace that comes from somebody else's sacrifice, right? Um, but culturally, and this is more the piece I want to address, when Christians have been taught to emulate Jesus' sacrifice, we often um, conv are convinced that we need to suffer to the same degree, or at least try to get to the point of some semblance of crucifixion. Um, and this is used abusively in, in lots of contexts. It's used to keep um, abused partners in their marriages, particularly uh, framed in the Pauline epistles. Marriage advice based on the Pauline epistles will often use this against the abused partner. I would argue it's used to, um, and I've actually seen it directly used, to convince soldiers that their job is um, sacred and that they're living up to Jesus' example by putting their life on the line. Um, and I think that it has a, um, a kind of cultural influence that convinces us to overdo things and helps us to justify it to ourselves when we overdo things. Thomas Aquinas argued that God didn't need the cross to forgive sin, that God's generosity and grace was plenty big enough that we, we didn't need to have a crucifixion in order for that to happen. 
that forgiveness of our sins or grace that helps us to change ourselves when we need it um, comes rather out of God's immense love and desire to be one with us. And this is another lesson that comes out of the prodigal son, right? The, the father doesn't say to the boy, go and whip yourself some more and um, earn your place in this family. I'm just glad to have you home. And that's all that matters. And that's the God that I would like to believe in, but sometimes forget is the God that I believe in. Um, so early friends abolish the laity, right? We're all ministers. And at various points in our lives, we are better positioned than at others to live out our priestly responsibilities. Our ministerial calls may be very focused on a particular issue or restricted to our family responsibilities. This does not invalidate our call, it just means that there's a season for every call that we have. Some friends feel an anxiety around their priestly responsibilities and the state of their meetings so much that they take on an unsustainable number of roles and hurt themselves and also those closest to them in the process. We need to be compassionate with ourselves when pain and anxiety make us short-sighted, but we also need to find the motivation to overcome the impulses to do too much. We rationalize doing too much by telling ourselves that we need to share our gifts, but sometimes we are deceived. Overextending robs our relationships, as Maggie said, of the quality of contribution we could make if we were well-rested. And it also robs others of the opportunity to express their own gifts. So um, the example I think of here is um, in my chaplaincy work at Queen's, you've heard of helicopter parenting. We actually talk about Velcro parenting. <laughs> Velcro. Um, so it's really interesting to watch this happen where parents are on campus and making phone calls, solving problems for their children that probably their children ought to be solving for themselves, right? And not every parent is doing this, um, but it's a, it's a visible thing. And when it happens, my impulse is to go to these parents and say, if you don't allow this child to learn how to take care of themselves, you're going to be in awfully big trouble when they need to take care of you. But we do that uh, in terms of the future of our meetings as well, right? Where elders continue to do. Um, and it's not always about sort of, I don't wanna use the term getting out of the way because I mean that can be a thing, it can be about control. Um, but it's also just about creating space and opportunity. I re remember when I was becoming clerk of Thousand Islands and I was replacing um, a retired person whose kids had left home and he was doing everything for the meeting. <laughs> and I said, there's no way I'm gonna be able to um, maintain the level of commitment that you've shown. And he said, we'll find out what's really important to friends. And so, I would suggest that if we do too much, we're also getting in the way of communal discernment, right? The sense of the meeting is what we can reasonably accomplish as a community, each one living up to their own measure of light without harming themselves. Uh, as an antidote to this, I would commend to you the work of a Lutheran theologian named Nadia Boltzweber. Uh, she uh, she's just awesome. She's this completely tattooed um, evangelical Lutheran pastor, very orthodox in her Lutheranism. And um, as she says, when she tells people what she does for a living, they really don't believe her. Um, <laughs> anyway, there's, she has a great talk on YouTube called um, Wednesday Night Dome Speaker. It's from uh, an evangelical Lutheran youth conference. She spoke at a couple of years ago. And um, it gives you her kind of take on Lutheran theology in a nutshell. And she also has a memoir entitled Pastrix. And I, I turn to that book often when I'm uh, feeling caught up by my perfectionism. 
Um, all of her work is very accessible and has let me down off many of the crosses that I have tried to attach myself to. So I want to close by sharing with you a song entitled The Ballad of Mary Magdalene by Richard Schindel. Does anybody else know this? If you do, feel free to join in. It's a fictional reflection on Jesus' death from Mary Magdalene's point of view. It's inaccurate in terms of the biblical witness, as there is no evidence that Mary Magdalene was a prostitute, but it is a wonderful and imaginative use of the story. The lyrics convict me when I realize I have put a cause ahead of, my primary, of the primary relationships in my life and that I am doing harm to the people I love most. Uh, with my commitment to overwork. And uh, when I'm finished singing, we'll worship for a moment and then you're free to go to lunch. My name is Mary Magdalene. I come from Palestine. Please excuse these rags I'm in. I've fallen on hard times. Long ago I had my work when I was in my prime. But I gave it up and all for love. It was his career, oh my. Jesus loved me, this I know. Why on earth did I ever let him go? He was always faithful, he was always kind. But he walked off with this heart of mine. A love like this will come but once. This I do believe, and I'll not see his like again as I live and breathe. I'm sorry if I might offend, but I tenderness I shared with him became a heresy. Jesus loved me, this I know. Why on earth did I ever let him go? He was always faithful, he was always kind, but he walked off with this heart of mine. I remember nights we spent whispering our creed. Our rituals are sacraments. The stars are canopy, and there beneath an olive tree, we'd offer up our plea. God's creation, innocent, his arms surrounding me. loved me, this I know. Why on earth did he ever have to go? He was always faithful, he was always kind, but he walked off with this heart of mine. 
was always kind, but he walked off with his heart.